Hi, everybody, my old friends mostly, who know like a hundred times more than I do, and I feel silly. But um, so we're on this whirlwind, you know, survey at this point. What in the structure that I was using is the path, you know, the, of those various eight practices of the charioteers of the lineage of accomplishment, M my literal translation. Wilson, I'm sorry you weren't here for me to totally end all conversation about literal translation, but I did, right? Right. Um, so starting with Nyingma, in Kongtol's, both of his, these books that we've been talking about, The Two Treasuries, Treasury of Knowledge and Treasury of Precious Instructions, he does say, and I think he says this in the catalog, which I recommend you read. By the way, you know, Tibetan catalogs aren't like what they sound like. They're actually readable, fascinating, historical, you know, information-packed things, at least when Kongtol does them. And so that is the one thing that's actually out there <laughs> on the table that you can get. Um, he does say that these are chronological. Um, from the handout, these, these eight, the way he treats these eight practice or accomplishment lineages, you may notice from the handout, do we have more handouts for the people who didn't come? Yeah. Can you give them to them? Uh, oh, uh, Ivan's getting it. Um, that, that original, um, what I'm calling, you know, the working kind of framework that he uses, that he borrowed from Prajna Rashmi, uh, has a different order, which is just interesting in itself. Uh, after Nyingma and then um, Nyingma and then Kadampa, then there's Chungpo Naljur of the Sh Shangpa, which we'll be talking about tonight. So it could be, you know, these uh, the second spreading of the Dharma, those charioteers that he's talking about, um, were active all very close to each other in the second spreading. They were all, you know, running off to India um, or running into Tibet. And so the chronology is kind of iffy anyway, and especially Chungpo Naljur's um, actual dates um, are confusing. And then after that comes the Lamdre in the form of Drokmi. So because there's so much to, you know, in each of those lineages, I want to try and at least you know, if nothing else in this whole weekend, like explain that one little quote that is in that handout um, on the last page, I think, or the second page. Um, so, Nyingma obviously is first, that's, there's no contention about that. Um, and the person mentioned as the charioteer is the translator of Verochana, in Tibetan called Berotsana, um, which some people like to keep uh, that pronunciation of it. Um, and so yesterday I talked a little bit about the difference of Sarma and Nyingma and you know, what, what just you know, transpired, but it's mostly historical. It's the fact that you know, the different kings of the empire, that this empire line of kings that goes back quite a long time into ancient Tibetan history um, had a big break with one of their descendants who was, didn't like Buddhism for various reasons, it's very complicated, and persecuted it, and didn't succeed in totally quashing it, but um, really made it kind of go underground for a while, which sometimes they call the, the, the time of fragmentation or the Dark Ages, which is very cool. Um, but, of course, from the viewpoint of the another religion in Tibet called Bumpo, those were, those were the, <laughs> that was the renaissance, that was the happy times, and everything else has been dark ages. But not anymore, I mean, in the new Bun religion, everything is very, very, very similar, and they're all happy together, of course. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the sort of dividing point of the new activity was during, was that about 90 years of the so-called Dark Ages, and then all the activity came up again with the story I told you about before, about the Gugye King. Um, and a few things, you know, those, the, so, and also, as I mentioned, the word Nyingma, and not only the word Nyingma, but the whole doxography of 
how it's organized and the literature and the structure of it is actually a later development during the second spreading. Um, <clears throat> so there wasn't that kind of you know, organizational element. Um, the old one scholar, Gene Smith, everybody like, you have to quote Gene Smith or else you're not really considered <laughs> you know, authentic. Um, he says, they are old, Nyingma, because their spiritual ancestors persisted in accepting and practicing the tantras that had been translated during the royal dynastic period, and they are Nyingmapa in relation to the Sarmapa adherents of the new. So we can kind of see a dual, you know, they are old because they were the sort of original um, teachings, and but only Nyingma in relation to Sarma, um, and he also um, <clears throat> we can talk about it as a first wave and a second wave, but um, uh, or some people like to call the new wave modernists, you know, because it's so modern, it's like the tenth century, and <laughs> um, and there was, as I mentioned, a conflict of of. There's, we'll talk about more of this in, in the Kadampa one as well that I'm going to go through today and also in the Lamdre that um, there were issues of, oh, I really got these dirty. There were issues of authenticity uh, and a lot of kind of turmoil about it. Um, however, they kept on, there's still, you know, even, er, even though that's called the earlier translation period, they did continue somewhat with translation activities. And in, okay, so now I'm gonna skip ahead. We're done with that like division and skip ahead to the later spreading when the Nyingma then got its name and started to be organized. Um, try, trying, as I said before last night, you know, trying to organize this massive amount of information, which is really an, was an impossible task. So the teachings that were mostly coming from that early translation period were later called kama, which just means precept, you know, oral kind of precepts, or the, it's like the word. It's like I, if I could, if I could just translate without thinking of all the baggage that we carry around, I would call it gospel. <laughs> it's the gospel. Um, it's the word, and so. And then there starts to be a whole new kind of literature coming into the Nyingma, which is called Terma. And that's the, you could say, the big division, the biggest of the possible divisions. Um, Kama and Terma. Terma means treasure, treasure texts. And this is, um, I mean, I don't want to be too snarky, as someone called me the first night, but. Um, you know, the second wave of all these different lineages being started and, and Indians coming to Tibet and Tibetans going to, you know, Marpa and all these like fantastic things. And then, and then the Nyingma were a little bit, the you know, ancient old teachings were a little bit under stress. Like they were about to become maybe obsolete. And, and, and in some cases, <clears throat> that was a concerted effort, such as by the king of Gugay. Um, to really, you know, f felt that they were inauthentic and also <clears throat> they'd gotten carried away with Tantra. You know, Tantra is very weird. I mean, I think the first actual Tantra I read from beginning to end was this Chakran Darwin, David Gray's translation. This is only like a couple years ago. And I thought, oh my goodness, is that what I've been practicing all this time? You know, and if I had read it before, I probably would not have. I mean, <laughs> Which is why the Tibetans don't generally read that stuff. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, they read commentaries on it. Be and also because the translations are really so terrible. But, um, uh, so, where was I? The Terma, I kind of think it was keeping up with the Joneses. You know, the Nyingma needed a kind of a, a, a shot in the arm, an upgrade, f you know, to, to not only to organize all the great material that had come during that early spreading, but also to keep up with the Sarma. You know, they were thinking of it. So they thought of the greatest thing ever. And it, it keeps going on until this very day and all the, <laughs> here I go snarkiness, but um, in all the advertising you see of nearly every teacher, like almost every modern teacher, Western or Tibetan, or so you see in there like their advertising that comes along is says, ancient wisdom for a modern world. 
And that's what the Nyingma did. They figured out that, you know, they could keep, the, they may not just keep, but really forge this uh, new connection with the ancient empire. And there's also this idea of like, um, I hadn't planned to say all this, the gold, you know, the golden age, everyone in, it seems in the whole world has this golden age archetype inside them of like, it was so much better when so-and-so, um, you know, we're like, oh, and Kennedy was president, you know, it was so great. And you don't look at the details, it's just like compared to now. Then that and so looking back at the age of the kings and the empire and the, you know, productions and translations and royal patronage and everything like that, it looked really good in the royal court when things were great and everyone was an emanation of either, you know, Avalokiteshvara or Tara, um, uh, or Manjushri maybe, then, so the Nyingmas decided that, you know, n or depending on how you take it, or Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, and some other great early uh, masters knew that this would happen in the future and therefore buried and hid a lot of teachings that would benefit future generations that were later revealed or dug up or found in various elements, found in all five, it says, of the five elements, found in the water, found in the earth, found in the sky, you know, one, like, really cool stuff. And, um, and then it was modern. It was modern because it was, ma it was created for the time that it was found, but it was taking advantage of the ancient golden age and the connection with all those wonderful things that happened around the royal court. And it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And all of those are called terma or treasure texts. And probably a lot of practices that you come in contact with are treasure texts. And in general, as literature goes, the treasure literature is infinitely more accessible than the comma. I mean, comma is really complicated and problematic. F not problematic, but complicated. You have to be a real master. I know my currently Nyingma teacher, um, Ganteng Tuku, he's, he just says comma is a headache. You know, because if he has to give an empowerment, it's very, very complicated. Whereas terma is just an easy transmission, and usually they're short, and usually they're very, you know, beautiful, uh, and lyrical even, and so, you know, it, it is a very skillful thing. <coughs> so anyway, there's that big, big kind of division. Then there's um, uh, the scheme of nine yanas or nine approaches that developed early on, although I did a little research about this once and I didn't refresh my memory about this. So, the, But, um, you know, ev the, um, what is it called? Tawai Trengwa, there's another word. Mengak Tawai Trengwa, is that it? Or is it Dangak? It's Mengak. Mengak Tawai Trengwa, which is the one text that like even really uptight, um, you know, Percy scholars say that maybe Guru Rinpoche actually did write that one thing. <laughs> um, Padma Sambhava, whose uh, whose status has in in Tibet became really overshadowed everything. Basically, the Buddha. If you study just directly with Tibetan masters, you you hear about Padma Sambhava, Guru Rinpoche way before you hear about the Buddha. I mean, it just completely, you know, is he's the guy. Uh, and then if you look at Western scholars, it's like Matthew Kapstein, it's like, well, maybe he was in Tibet for like two weeks and met the king once. So there's this huge <laughs> range of, you know, whereas Tibetans will say there isn't, uh, in all of the Tibetan Himalaya region, there's nothing, no space bigger than um, a ox's footprint in the mud that he did not, tread on. So it's a big, you know, it was valorized to say the least. Um, and also the other, the, along with the kings and the royal court, um, Guru Rinpoche and then Barochana, the big translator, the one that's, that Kongtrol is citing as the one, you know, the, the, our man, our, our narrow point that comes between to, um, India and Tibet. Um, those t are like, given, you can read the life of Arachana, it's like it's fantastic. All these lives are fantastic, by the way. I just, 
got Jamgun Control, the translation of Jamgun Control's um, uh, life story of Jamyon Kense Wangpo. You know, th if you prefer to read biographies, you read those kind of things about this time period, and it's fantastic, fantastical. Um, all right, nine yanas. So that was. So where was I? Like I lost my. Yeah. So anyway, the Tawi Trangwa by Pamasambab. I realized I'm so. You know, presumably somewhere in the world there's someone who doesn't know his name. So I have to say it. Um, uh, I looked at that, and that was supposed to be a source of this nine yana scheme. But actually, he mentions ten yanas, and sometimes you know eight, and it's not at all solidified. And I haven't seen a paper, I'm sure somebody has done a paper on this that I haven't seen yet, but if not, somebody should on how the gradual, um, you know, kind of decision and solidification of nine came about. Um, as with all of these lists, they, they didn't just pop in, you know, it, they, were, they developed over time. Anyway, the nine yanas, the first of the three classical yanas, that are in all of Buddhism, which is the, the Shravaka Yana, Pracheka Buddha Yana, and Bodhisattva Yana. I shouldn't say all of Buddhism, of course, because since there's a Bodhisattva Yana, uh, it's Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and f a lot of people think, like, they hear three Yanas, and they think Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, but in all Buddhist texts, the three Yanas refer to these three, Shravaka Yana and Pracheka, Shravakas are the hearers, Pracheka Buddha, Buddhas are people who we don't know about in caves somewhere who may ha be having a huge cosmic influence, but we never hear about them because they're in caves somewhere. And that's called, we translate it as self, self-realized or self-Buddhas or something like that because they don't have students and they don't have teachers. Um, and bodhisattvas, and I think we all know bodhisattvas, and I'm not gonna explain them because they're in Miriam Webster <laughs> now. Um, um, so those are the first three related to sutra teachings. And another big division of all the literature that came into Tibet is sutra and tantra. And in, in India too, although they didn't make that distinction, but you know, those, it's two kinds of literature really. If you're wondering what sutra is and tantra is, is sutrayana is based on the sutras of the Buddha. Tantrayana is based on the tantras, which were revealed through manifestation of the Buddha called Vajradhara or, you know, Samantabhadra or whoever, whoever you prefer to see the Buddha as whichever costume he should wear. Um, and then the three outer, so-called three, and then the next six yanas are all about Tantra. There's the three outer Tantras, which are Kriya, Tantra, Charya, Tantra, and Yoga Tantra. And those are um, similar to a later scheme of the Sarma schools. And I don't think we need to go into them. You know, it's uh, also, uh, once again, every time you, I find a definition of each of those yanas, um, there's exceptions right away. You know, they're trying to fit all the tantras into a kind of like, and then say, oh, these are all about, like Kriya, these are all about activity and purify, purification and pure behavior, you know, kind of Brahmanical behavior and everything. And, and that's fine, but then you, you know, then they will classify something like Tara practice as Kriya Tantra, and there you're doing mantras and offering Tormas, and you know, so, so it doesn't, doesn't hold so much, but it might be interesting for you to study some of you, but not today. Um, <laughs> and then the last three are so-called inner tantras, are, are Maha Yoga, Anu Yoga, and Ati Yoga. And that's the three that are really associated most with the Nyingma. Um, and even those are, you know, same thing goes with those, that as soon as you start talking about them, there's exceptions to them, but just very briefly, okay, glasses. Um, the, the first of those is, is like the teachings of Mahayoga, and by far the most, I would say, the most complicated, complex, interesting, uh, and it has a lot to do with visualization practices and uh, actually amazing stuff. Um, I think, what's the name of the, I mean, I think what's going to be a really interesting book to look at if, if you're really interested in Mahayoga, Yoga, which is really like a lifetime study. I mean, you have to really be at this for a long time, is the one, Jeremy Dorji's new translation of 
Nyingma. What's it called? The Complete Nyingma School. Yeah, the Complete Nyingma School. It's. I don't think it's out yet. The first volume is out, but that's a very foundational. But the second one is focused on Maha Yoga with, like, a really excellent translator. So um, that should be interesting. Um, and I mean, I can read you little synopses of those, but I don't think I don't think that'll be all that interesting, really. Um, and then. And I can't possibly summarize my yoga. I mean, that's out of the question. Um, and and then there's the Ati yoga, which a lot of people have been interested in. And, and typically, people like to go to what is supposedly the highest. So th there, there's a, obviously a setup here of these nine yanas of a hierarchy of teaching, even though one could very well argue that you know n they build on each other, and you can't you know you can't get you can't skip those other ones, and that they're all important, possibly all important equally. Also, depending on who the people practicing are. I mean, if you practice, I think there's a quote actually that Control uses about um, an instantaneous path and a gradual path that comes within these Nyingma teachings, and he says that the you know, the instantaneous path is poison for a person who is geared towards a gradual path and vice versa. So, I mean, you can say hierarchy, one's higher than the other, but actually if it's poison, you know, who, that's not so, that's not such a good um, recommendation of it. So, um, Ati yoga then is is one of the categories, and it's divided into. Um, <clears throat> so I always like this way of you know that everything always I was mentioning always becomes more non-dual, you know. So the Anu yoga is more non-dual than <laughs> Maha yoga because you're still visualizing all this stuff, but you really still are in Anu yoga too. So then there's Ati yoga, which is really non-dual. But then within Ati Yoga, then there's, there's the three levels of Semde, Longde, and Mengakde, Semde mind class. So that's within the category of Ati mind class teachings and uh, space class and uh, esoteric instruction class, which is really, really non-dual. <laughs> but then within esoteric class, you get Dzogchen, uh, Dzogchen, which has two parts, Trekchu and Turgal, which I won't try and translate, but <clears throat> and those are even more and more non-dual. And then, you know, so then you get like Mangok saying, well, long day and sim day, they're really dualistic. But, you know, so, th so there just tends to be this thing of ever-increasing coolness. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a question about that? Yeah, actually. Um, so Can we just get you to use the mic? So the oh, okay. That's good. I can, I can find my place while you... Perpetual um, pursuit is trying to figure out which teaching I'm getting or which teaching <laughs> right. I'm picking up a book and which teaching, which, you know, yana does right, this right. go into. Do you think it matters, though? I'm not sure it matters, except for if you're trying to, I mean, I'm talking about this because I, you know, I can't really talk about the actual practices, and so because it would be just immense. Um, so we're talking about the structure, how it was structured. But what difference does it make? I mean, it shouldn't make a difference. You know, people want to get feel like they're getting the highest teaching, but if that's useless, what's the point? So I, I think it actually doesn't matter at all. You don't need to know that. You just practice what feels, you know, what you have a connection with. That's what I think. You don't have to worry where it f falls here, unless, Someone asks you, like other lamas, like, well, what have you received? And then you have to rattle out your credentials. But Is that okay? I know there's, I, you know, we, just like these people yeah, who I organize this, really. feel better if we can, like, mm, you know, just get it down one, two, three, and it fits right, right in here. And sometimes you can do that. And, um, Oh, how to find like the commentaries well, to yeah. Yeah, here you are, and you pick up this book, and I know. Lo and behold, it has you know too much stuff. And um, then having had conversation with a the teacher, then it's like, 
well, you should know that was blah, 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 not blah, blah, blah. And yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say except, you know, read my book. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> There, I, I, I take that back because, I mean, I've gone a million miles away from simplification. Um, but there are ones that, you know, where there's an attempt to very much simplify. But, yeah, that, that does happen. And um, when we were talking about translation and I was doing this book, Esoteric Instructions, it was really difficult to get, you know, the Pandita's influence because there was no one Lama who knew all the eight, actually. Um, and I actually had different informants for each of the eight. And very, very, you find very few people who have, know in depth all of them. So if you go to one Lama, they're going to expect you, depending on which kind of affiliation they have, to know, like, how come you don't know the difference of Kama and Terma, you know? But if you were going to, say, a Galupa Lama, they don't care you know that or not because they're not looking at those texts they're looking they want you to know the seven you know seven points of mind training maybe or something else why don't you know those seven can't you listen you know so it's it's really hard you just have to kind of go deep into one which is what I was talking about before is into you know is like this focus within diversity you have the diversity and then you go into one and then you can actually know where you are you know, then you can look at one chapter of the book or, and, and find, um, you know, find your way within that. You wouldn't be expected to know all this unless you have to translate it. Um, okay, so a little bit mo about what John Goncontro says um, about some of these, these people I wanted to, um, uh, you know, he has these different divisions. Um, just in terms of um, the long, the comma, according to control, um, he cites the primary sources for this tradition. I'm just going to name some of the sources because it's important. Is the this Mahayoga text called I called the Net of Magical Manifestation, or based on a Guya Garba Tantra, which is really a whole cycle. It's not like one book, but um, and that's the one I, I was recommending that and the Gathering of Intentions Sutra for Anu Yoga. And for the two traditions of the mind class, there's the 18 Tantras of Mother and Child um, for the Ati Yoga. Sorry, that's Ati Yoga. So you've got, you've got kind of the three classes of teachings based on three source texts according to control. And then he has another very important Nyingma classification or teaching, which are the eight transmitted precepts. Trungpa Rinpoche used to call these the I don't know if we have the, that contingent here today or not, but we used to call them the eight great Haruka practices. Um, Kondro classifies those as auxiliaries. Um, and then within the great completion, Dzogchen, um, you have the secret cycles of vital essence, Tiglis Angkor, and which is now known as the four-part innermost essence. Um, so those are the... Those are the kind of source texts that he names. And then um, uh, he actually identifies six different transmissions of Nyingma. Um, the first one with, from Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche of Udiana, an emanation of Amitabha, uh, was invited to Tibet by the... The, you know, probably the most Buddhist of the Buddhist kings, Trisong Detson, and who built the first Semiling monastery, and you probably all know about that story. And um, there was Shantarakshita, the three great ones at that time, Shantarakshita, Padmasambhava, and, um, and, Gur and uh, the king himself, Trisong Detson, who himself did some translation as well. Um, and then I mentioned that garland of views of esoteric instructions, the Tao Mangak Tao Trengwa. Um, and he, that's considered the first transmission. The second transmission is the one that's mentioned in our little eightfold scheme, which is Verochana, um, the translator Verochana in the eighth century. The first, he's known as the first great bilingual translator, in, bilingual master, of course. Um, he better be a he better be bilingual if he's a translator, I guess. 
although I'm reminded of, I was, rem this is here that everybody said they like diversions, so I used to translate for Chakta Rinpoche from his terrible English, and the reason I could do that in one English to English is because he spoke in a word-for-word -word translation of his Tibetan into using English words with Tibetan grammar, which actually reminds me a lot of the Tibetan translations of Sanskrit. But because I knew Tibetan, I could translate his English. That's weird, right? That could be the first unilingual translator. <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, and there are, he does have, he also uses translators that are unilingual, that don't know any Tibetan, but just got to know him so very well that they, knew, or at least they thought they knew what he was trying to say. Um, so Vero Chana um, sent King Trisen Detson sent him to India where he met Sri Singha and you know received all kinds of the 18 instructions of the mind class of the great completion um, as well as all of the empowerments and esoteric instructions of 60 tantras and teachings of the space class he met 21 other teachers and so on and so forth uh, the, and, and they come up with the number six million and four hundred thousand teachings of the great completion, and um, um, you know can, with, through which you can have realization. <clears throat> it might be confusing. Um, is it Ati Yoga or is it Dzogchen? What's the difference in those two? And and it's really about doxography. It's really about Ati Yoga is the word used when the scheme of the nine yanas. Um, is used. And then Dzogchen really refers to the teachings themselves more, I would say. Um, sometimes translated as a great perfection, great completion, great completeness. I think that's about it for translations, unless there's been some very clever new, new ones. Anyone seen any new ones? Okay, so, so far you only have three to learn. It was you that's complaining about all the different... <laughs> 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 I know, and then that's Sanskrit, and that's confusing, and what language, yes. Yep, it's bad stuff. Ati, ati is a Sanskrit or Indian word in any case. But when that's translated, it's even more confusing. So uh, the third transmission Kongto mentions is from the master Vimala Mitra, and then there's the fourth is Nup Sanjay Yeshe. I won't go through all these because it'll just be more confusing. The fifth is the lineage of Ma and Nyak and their successors. Uh, many of these great masters. Uh, and then the sixth is just is the treasure tradition, the terma that appeared later. Many of these traditions um, are just f or further elaborations and commentaries on those original scriptures such as the Gui Garba, such as the magical net of illusion or magical whatever it's called, um, which is finally being, I mean, f you know, finally being really investigated by some, some translators and there's some, you know, major things that are coming out if you want to find out more about those. What else do I have to say about, I mean, we have this Nyingma master sitting right there that's making, do you want to add something? No, huh? no, he has jet lag. Um, <laughs> um, what else can I say about it? It's, um, I mean, there's an interesting article. I did do a little research on, uh, on a new, but I don't know where it is now. Anyway, I was reading one. I think an interesting person to read here is, um, Sam Van Shaikh, or Shake, Sam Van Shaikh, who is really focused, and also Karm, Karma Sa, Karme Samten. Both of them have focused on very early documents, the earliest, you know, kind of what really happened back then, and, you know, um, the, when they unearthed the caves at Dunhuang, which was on the Silk Route and formerly ruled by the great Buddhist empire. Emperor Songsen Gompo, the first Buddhist, so-called first Buddhist Dharma king, who emanation of Avalokiteshvara of Chinrezi, who was a huge conqueror, bloody battle conqueror that uh, extended the Tibetan Empire halfway down the subcontinent and up through Mongolia, China, and you know, massive thing, and didn't particularly stop when he became Buddhist. But there were a lot of um, there were a lot of 
influences of various women on him and things that, um, anyway, where was I going with that one? Yeah, though, right, in Sam Van Schaik, and you can look up his, actually his website, and I, I really like that stuff, I don't know why. I really like finding out like what kind of, by, through textual analysis, of course, because there's no other way, as I mentioned, but you know, what, what really happened, what was early, when was Dzogchen, he, he, in a paper that he did that I just read, and I thought I had, but apparently don't, um, he uh, posits that there is, you know, an influence from India for Dzogchen, and that sometimes you hear that there's not. Sometimes you hear it's a bumbo or indigenous kind of thing from, particularly from one Nyingma Lama called Namke Norbu. He, who is a great historian, actually, you know, says that anyway, Dzogchen's not Buddhist at all, um, which is exactly what the enemies of Dzogchen want to hear. The enemies of the Nyingma wanted to hear that, and he kind of played right into it, um, but he's a very much of a Tibetan nationalist kind of, and so he, you know, it was meaningful to think of it as a Tibetan, you know, you know, not everything is borrowed from another culture. It's possible to have these really enlightening teachings amazing teachings that come from other masters, um, especially from the West of West Tibet, Shangsheng, and <coughs> anyway, read Namgyen if you're interested in that. Don't listen to him about vegetarianism. He's just terrible, but <laughs> he's a big proponent of meat eating. Um, anyway, he is, not me, not me. Uh, yeah, so I don't know what else. I felt like I was going to say something else about these Nyingma teachings. Um, they're wonderful, and um, around Trungpa Rinpoche started using the term Kan Ying, you know, Kargyu Nyingma, um, which is a big gap. You know, Nyingma as it was before the, in the early spreading, and as it, and the Kargyu, which is a new school, um, there's certainly very similar teachings, and that's the whole point of Jamgun Control, is the fact that all of these teachings, they're all from the same source, based on the same ideas, and leading to the same results, no matter what. So you can do that. You can say Kan Ying, and mostly Nyings don't like that, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, Trungpa did it, and that's our American Dharma. Nobody's had more influence on it than he has, so there it is. Um, are there any questions on this? I'm going to move on to Kadampa if, if, yes. I just want to, uh, <coughs> oh, you have to wait. And then they have to turn the camera on you. No, I just wanted to actually uh, take up what you said in answer to your question about the, uh, you know, knowing what sort of level of teaching you're receiving. And I've always understood that, uh, Many, you know, when you when you are re receiving instructions from a Dzogchen master, he's actually what he's trying to do is actually point to your real nature, and so very often they have this idea that these different categories of of the doxographies are actually a distraction from that, and so what often happens is that a Dzogchen master will actually be teaching you Dzogchen, but he will not say what it is. Yeah. Right. Because what's the point? The point he's getting at is actually getting you. To uh, to yeah to understand the you know or to orientate you towards the experience of your own uh, the uh, the nature of the mind, so um, it's um, you know like and and many many of the great yogis you know people who have attained uh, rainbow body like in modern times have been extremely simple people who didn't have any study at all and wouldn't have known the difference between ati and anu yeah. and maha and so on. Except, un unless actually you actually told them what you were talking about, and then of course they'd understand you, but you know, they wouldn't know any of the, you know, the, the theory about it. And um, so it's, yeah. as you said, you know, it's not in, in a way it's a kind of distraction to sort of be worrying about what, yeah. you know. Because the, tr agree. the trouble is that there's a side of us all which is very proud, and we always want the best. We always want to think that we're receiving the highest teaching. And so we try to think. Oh, well, and I'm so you should, really no matter what you're or? receiving. So <laughs> you should think it's the highest teaching. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but and it, and it is depending on the depending on the you know. It the is the need of the person. If it's question. perfect for you, it is yeah. the highest teaching. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well said. I agree with you. I uh, 
was lucky enough when I was living in Nepal, one of the times I was kicked out of India, <coughs> where I would have been studying with Kalarimche. And so, you know, I was looking for someone to study with, and Tukurjan was there, Tukurjan Rinpoche, who was just building his monastery. And I used to get instructions for him every other day, even though the building wasn't finished. So you'd walk up the third floor, you know, and there was like an open wall and then a giant mastiff <laughs> down at the bottom. That was the scariest part. But um, anyway, he gave these teachings of a sort of question and answer nature and would make, there was three of us, I think, would make us come back to, with answers. And then in, in, in he, you know, there were things like that we were supposed to discover in meditation, like, you know, is, uh, are, you know, are you basically body, speech, and mind, are they all one thing or, or are they three different things? Things like that. And, uh, of course, you know, you go home, go back to my hut out in the, <laughs> which a grain storage hut that I lived in with no bathroom or anything. But, um, um, and there was like three books you could look at. Gunter, as well, you know, and a few others. And I'd be like, oh my God, what's the answer? And then I'd go back and say, what I had thought I found, and, and of course he knew right away and said, and Chuginima, his son, was translating, and he said, you know, don't look in books. He knew right away. So then you go back and try it again, and, and then we three would come back, and he, whoever he asked first, you know, the other two would sort of copy, and he goes, don't copy each other, and then he made it write down the answers, and all this kind of process, and it was, it was amazing. I never, you know, I mean, this is, a, is an oxymoron. I never meditated so hard. I felt like I was sweating while I was meditating, trying to get the right answer, you know, for him that I had to go see the next, in a couple of days. And um, anyway, I finally gave up and I said, I don't know. And then Tuginima, the translator, started jumping up and down saying, not no is no, not no is no. And <laughs> his English wasn't that great. But um, a long, long ages later, I realized that that is an introductory Dzogchen technique and practice in the whole thing. And he never told me that. You know, I had no idea what it was. He just made us go do this stuff. It was really, it was, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, and then my first thought way later was, oh, I should have made more offerings. <laughs> because, I mean, I just was taking for granted that, you know, he didn't have much to do, and, you know, he was amusing himself with these three Westerners. But it was actually very, very wonderful. And in that kind of case, and, and, and totally, as Wilson said, and what Larry said on Thursday night, too, about sometimes if you really don't know what's happening, I mean, Larry said if, you know, Actually, it's not what Larry said, is it? Larry said if, you know, there's some big secret, you come to appreciate it when you finally get it. But I think it's uh, very fresh if you don't even know you're getting it. You know, if you don't even, I mean, if you really sincerely with no extra f ideas about it, ha get into it for whatever wrong reason, like pleasing the guy who's asking you, you know, going back to elementary school programming that we have. I just want to get an A. <laughs> but yes, p pain. <laughs> I'm saying that. Name. I'm sure it's P A Y N E, right? Yes, it is. Uh, okay. You got it. Uh, you're talking about the Dunhuang text. Yeah. Um, there, I think there's a book right over there somewhere called like Tibetan Zen. And oh, right, yeah. And controls saying, you know, the path of liberation has gradual and instantaneous realization. Yeah, those are two very specific categories. So, um, you know, the... Is the it Zen? Yeah, th I'm, I, this is what I'm tr I guess I'm trying to ask about with the sure. Zogchen stuff. Um, yeah. You kind of mentioned the criticisms of it, I guess, yes. by like Sakya Pandita or something. Um, um, not so much. Sakya Pandita really went after Kargyu big yeah. time, but... Um, uh, every Sarma, you know, there was, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. It was criticism of this instantaneous thing yeah. and it being tied to, I mean, the, the yeah, stuff? Yeah, there's, um, this is kind of, well, Tibetan history is criticized a lot, historiography that they did themselves, particularly because almost 
really like 90% of it is terma, you know, so nobody was writing it at the time. But there is some Tan Wang documents. There's a few that were written early. But it's a big rewritten history that I've spoken about of, of seeing, it's like a pure view history, you know, of seeing all the past in the golden age in this light of, of a cosmic Buddhist, you know, e emanations of Tara and Avalokiteshvara and all this fantastic stuff. And they similarly, uh, in recording the history of the influences, um, have somewhat rewritten it. And so in Sam Mi Ling, there was this supposedly famous debate. Obviously, there's a big Zen influence because, you know, China's right there. Hundreds of years, you know, translations started in China hundreds of years before they did in Tibet. And there's the Silk Route. They're all kind of meeting each other. There's invasions back and forth. I mean, there's a big influence there. And the way that the history records it, the Tibetan history records it, is that um, the king invite, uh, invite Shana Rakshida left because he, I mean, I think he got fed up. <laughs> but, and he said, my disciple Kamala Shila can defend this Indian view of Buddhism versus, and there was, by then, of course, there was some Zen masters and Chinese masters in Tibet, uh, and one that they just call him Mah <laughs> Mahayana, <laughs> Mohayan, Huashang, which just means monk. So, um, so the how it went is this is the big Samye debate that went on. It may have been on for a couple of days or a couple of years. No one's really sure. And arguing that very point, instantaneous enlightenment versus gradual enlightenment. And it's, very, it's a lot more subtle than the kind of, you know, when you, and I, I usually spend a long time in class on that, and we even have the debate. We, we try and replicate the debate. It's really fun. I assign randomly who's on whose side, but um, because they're both very good arguments. But the way it's written is that uh, that the uh, Chinese was absolutely trounced. I mean, he was completely, you know, uh, he had to run with his with his robes between his legs back to China. And uh, of course, the Chinese account, and they were much better historians, I might say, from our point, from a you know Western scholarship point of view, but. That, you know, it happened a little differently. But from the, the, the Tibetan story is from that point on, all there is is Indian Buddhism in Tibet because the debate. D you know, I, to really talk about this, I'd have to go through this whole kind of like Asian history of debate. You know, when you debate something, you know, there's terms of debate and everything, and even you can have a miracle debate or whatever, but the winner takes all. The winner everybody else has to convert to that religion. Um, so from that point, you know, from the winning of that debate, and, but of course it was the king, the Tibetan king, who decided who won in the first place. And also, I mean, India is the birthplace of the Buddha and the Buddhist teaching, so you know, that's a good reason, and, and there's uh, m maybe more exchange, I guess. I don't know if that's true, though, because you have to cross over the Himalayas to get there, but, um, but anyway, since that time, even those words, even the words like um, yidlami jepa, you know, not doing anything in the mind, the total non-engagement of the mind becomes like this scare tactic, like, like it's a sign. It's like, uh, like if you, I mean, we have a lot of those trigger words now, right? And, and, you know, that you might say one and then be called a bigot from then on, or you might be called some really radical thing from one term, like that term doing nothing in mind is one of those trigger words going back to in the big accusation of you're like Huashang Mahayan. And the, uh, is leveled at Nyingma teachings a lot, actually. You're like Huashang Mahayan. And the Nyingma uh, masters, in their turn, try and teach that teaching at the same time as denying that it's the same teaching as, as uh, Zen, basically. but. That may be whatever, you know, but it's there. I mean, Zen teachings of instantaneous alignment are there in many of the lineages, not just Nyingma. And uh, it's just called something else, and it's definitely not Washang Mohayan's version. So that's kind of how that history, I think, is viewed. Um, of course, there's a big influence, and even there's even an influence like uh, Kapstein, Matthew Kapstein sort of traced an influence of a Korean Zen master in Tibet. You know that uh, you don't hear much about at all. 
that uh, you know you, they don't really actually want to talk about that much, and uh, particularly now. Well, the Chinese. I mean, they've invaded the country. You know, the, the, we're not going to hear the you know Chinese Buddhism has been in Tibet all this time. It, it, you hear it from the Chinese, but not from the Tibetans. So that's you know, it's always involved in politics, as I've kind of said. But those teachings, which are very great teachings, and I personally think definitely that there's particular people who benefit from those particular teachings, and why w you know it would be a great shame to lose them. Um, Zen isn't that different in the same way as Dzogchen, I think. Zen always says, you know, oh, we don't look at any texts, but they totally do. And same with <laughs> Dzogchen, you know, look at this literature. It's just massive literature, but there's this claim it's non-dual, you don't really need to look at any texts or anything. So, But you know what, no, very few people can just hang out in non-duality. They need to do something. So then along came the Kadampas, <laughs> needing to do something. Um, this is the, the kind of the beginning of the new wave, the new spreading of the teachings uh, are called Kadampa. Now, and the, the person that is, you know, the big translator of that, of that class is um, Rinshin Zongpo, but Dromtun is given in this, in this, kind of framework, uh, it's Drum Tumpa, one of the students of um, Atisha. Atisha is really the big, you know, head honcho of the whole second wave. Um, although, being partial to translators, I tend to think it's Rinchen Zongbo, his elder, who, who really, um, the Tibetan, um, who worked with him and who focused it. But remember the story of the king who, I read the edict of him, and he kind of said there's all these false things going on. Well, you don't remember because most of you weren't here. But anyway, watch the tape. And um, he, that king, uh, uh, Lama Yeshe U, -er, sent uh, Rinshin Zangpo to and others actually um, to get Atisha. There's a story about the weight of gold and trying to get him to come and everything. And so Atisha. In his dates, 982 to 1054, was invited, um, kind of reluctantly, to come to Tibet, um, and he he um, agreed to come um, for three years. But it ended up that he never left, and he died there 12 years later. So he had 12 teaching years in Tibet, and the, and a tremendous production of interesting things. There's a lot to know about this, and also. Um, you know, he, he brought Madhyamaka teachings, he brought, um, he wrote a, he wrote m what's usually the proto seen as the prototype of the Lamrim teachings. Have you heard of Lamrim teachings, the graded or gradual path um, based on Indian gradual path Buddhism, and it's called A Lamp for the Path to Awakening. That's the usual translation of it. It's very readily available. I always use it as the kind of, here's the real, here's the first Lamrim. Every, all these eight lineages, all of them have some kind of Lamrim. And this is the first one. Although you could argue that Kamala Shila's, uh, a Gomrim is the same, really, you know, the, the Bhavana Krama of Kamala Shila, the guy that won the debate forever, the final word. Um, he, is a similar thing, and also there's another genre called Tenrim. They're all kind of the same idea, but this lamp for the path to awakening, you can get it for free from uh, the Lama Yeshe archives, or you can, uh, I like the old translation of um, Geshe Sonam Rinchen and Ruth Sonam, uh, incredible commentary, it's an incredibly interesting text. The story behind it, the kind of like, you know, the one they like to tell a little bit is that this king was complaining about all this Nyingma, you know, tantric practice that had gotten out of hand. Particularly, you know, there's weird stuff in tantra, you know, like, you know, sex and war or whatever. But um, that he was supposed to bring teachings to the Tibetans that didn't have any of that tantric stuff. Now, Atisha actually was also a tantric practitioner. He, he uh, you know, at, at in, in India, um, 
brought, had them both, but you know, that he was kind of um, pressured to leave it out. And there's like two lines in this Path to Awakening where he discusses whether or not monks, monastics, uh, and he's, you know, he's also credited with a kind of reform movement to get the monastics back in line uh, and you know, establish the Vinaya or the, you know, the dis rules of discipline in a better way, whether monks can actually receive certain aspects of tantric empowerment. Um, and that's hotly debated. You know, you have this beautiful book of the path, of the spiritual path of Tibetan Buddhism, and then there's these two lines that everybody is still going on about. So I'm not going to go on about them, but you can look for them. Um, but any, uh, he, Kongtol, Jamgun Kongtol, uh, um, identifies three main lineages from the Kadampa. Um, and we don't, Unfortunately, and we need to know these now because now that word Kadampa has taken on a whole other meaning in modern times in the West. Um, so the three lineage uh, that developed from Atisha's teachings, there's a general precept lineage or Kargyu, you could call it, and the two particular uh, traditions of the old and the new Kadampa. Um, he had innumerable students in India but the first Tibetan disciple, um, who was the one who actually it was, uh, carried his invitation, is the translator, Natsok Tsultim Gyalwa, who stayed with him for 19 years, and a lineage came called Natsok Kargyu, based on that person. And then um, an, his main successor, um, Another, another person, Rongpa Chaksoro, who was a student of his main successor, Drom Tumpa. So Drom Tumpa is the one that's named here in um, Prajna Rashmi's, you know, the quotation, Upasaka Drom Tun. Um, Drom Tumpa, who also received, you know, t this one received teachings from both Drom Tumpa and Nakso, and um, that one became known as blah, 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 blah. Um, Oh, where did it end up? Uh, um, another Kargyu kind of lineage. The, well, I don't know if you're going to go into this, but the word Kargyu just means a transmission, a lineage of, t of t precepts or teachings, Kargyu. So sometimes the word Kargyu is not always used specifically in relation to the school of Kargyu. Um, that's what happened with Shankpa teaching, Shankpa Kargyu, even though that's quite a bit different. Um, so those are the ones that are um, associated with Kargyu. And as you n n may know already, the Karma Kargyu as it is now got a great deal of teachings from the Kadampa um, lineage, particularly through Gempopa, through the very founder of, you know, basically of the Kargyu school was um, Kadampa, and got all, so all the teachings in Kargyu are either from that lineage or from, you know, the Milarepa, Yogi, Mahasiddha lineage. Um, and then there's the old Kadampa, which is actually the precept lineage of Drum Tumpa. So this is 10, this is early, you know, this is the, beginning of the 11th, very beginning of the 11th century. Uh, it's known as the precious Kadam embodying seven deities and dharmas. Do you want to know what all that is? is it three, three of those seven are the three original baskets, or the, you know, Tripitaka. And then there's four deities. One of them is Shakyamuni Buddha. I think there's Tara Avalokiteshvara and Achala, I believe, are the other ones. Um, the, the, that old Kadampa, the true old Kadampa uh, practices as their main practices. Um, and then there's also, I'm going to go back to talking about the path of awakening, but um, the sort of esoteric aspect, you know, that was transmitted within Kadampa is called the 16 vital essences with their empowerments and guidances. And, uh, and a, a text called, this is just called the Precious Volume that are used, that was by uh, Pu Chunghua. Um, all of those, though, were eventually absorbed into the Kamsan Kargyu and the Galupa lineage through Gendendrup, the first Dalai Lama. So all those teachings got absorbed into both what we know now as Kargyu or 
Kamtan Kargyu or um, Kalupa. The, what what Kongto is calling the new Kadampa is what we now call Gedemba or or Gelukpa, and that's from the great Songkhapa. Um, he, he it's not considered as much as like one of the original lineages, but it's a it's the offshoot or the inheritor, the descendant of the Kadampa, and that that Kongto calls new Kadampa, so. Tsongkhapa, Lozang Drakpa, that's now 1357 to 1419, so it's moved up to about the 15th century. So, and had in, um, incalculable influence. I mean, you've all heard of Tsongkhapa, right? And then he wrote, based on that Path to Awakening by Atisha, he wrote something called the Lamrim Chemmo. If I look around, I can probably spot it because it's like three volumes about this big. Chenmo means big. Oh, yeah. Yep. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, red and yellow, three volumes. Uh, it's it's in it, painful detail, I'd say, <laughs> and is really um, a, a main teaching. I mean, uh, in Galupa centers now. And then I guess I have to mention, so you don't get confused, that um, a, a particular teacher who lived in the West for a long time in England, I think he still lives in England, um, decided to call, he who opposes the Dalai Lama, is very much against the Dalai Lama, and there's a whole movement opposing the Dalai Lama, who is sometimes, the Dalai Lama is considered the um, sort of head of the Galupa, although that's not technically true. But um, anyway, he decided, to, this Geshe decided to call his lineage, New Kadampa. So that can be confusing. Um, and this is in a very unfortunate kind of, I don't know, religious sectarian war that's going on right now. They'll march against, you know, they, they protest with signs and everything, claim the Dalai Lama doesn't allow religious freedom. And um, very unfortunate, that Geshe was a very learned Geshe, put out some great books. Now I had to stop reading them because <laughs> He turned against us. But um, so this terminology isn't really used anymore. Uh, you can't really call Galupa New Kadampa anymore because then that would be very confusing. So we could just stick with Galupa. The main teachings, even, even in Kontrol's book of esoteric instructions on Mengak, you know, on, es on the esoteric kind of aspect, is really mainly mind training, Lojong. Uh, fantastic, there's like a whole, a whole shelf right there, and also Nico has, he sent me last night, you can go on the Shambhala website and see his most recent list of good books to read uh, about mind training and Lojong. And it's a fantastically developed Mahayana, you know, I mean the Tibetans don't make that distinction, oh, this is the Mahayana, you know, it's like, Hinayana and Mahayana Vajrayana. The only distinction they make according to those three yanas that we've sort of learned in the West, unfortunately, is uh, in talking about vows, the levels, the different kinds of vows that you have, that you have Pradimoksha vows, then you have um, Bodhisattva vows to, you know, be, you know, king of the universe and save everybody, and and then Vajrayana vows, um, which is a, which is a, Every single Tibetan since the beginning of time to have to you know earn their earn their status had to write a book on the three vows, including the Treasury of Knowledge, which was originally a treatise on the three vows. And it's a nice it's a nice way to divide things up. It might seem arcane to us because well, well who needs vows? You know who has vows anymore? But and especially who keeps them? But um, the word, you know, the sacred word, I mean, it was a hugely important, and Buddhism around the world is based on monasticism of people holding vows. And in the Abhidharma, it's even discussed whether, if you have vows, whether they are physically in your body, like when you die, are those vows there in your dead body? I mean, it's that much of a important and solidified thing. So there's no way to underestimate that, and I don't want to do that because it's an important aspect of Tibetan Buddhism, but um, 
normally the, all of these teachings you find in the eight practice lineages, there's nobody like dividing them up saying, this is Hinayana, this is Mahayana, this is Vajrayana. It's all just, you got to do it all. So Lojong teachings, which are often called just like the Mahayana teachings, well, they're really universal and um, very wonderful. And the develop, you know, they're, they're the, how to be in a bodhisattva apprentice. It's an apprenticeship to being a bodhisattva and developing love and kindness, loving kindness, which is considered to be intrinsic to people, even no matter how nasty they seem. And so therefore it's workable develop, and you can develop it and you can be an apprentice and you can become a compassionate person. And so that's what all those teachings are about and they're great. Yes. Oh, Shambhala pubs. Yeah, and just look for Lojong, L-O-J-O-N-G. And, and Nico, do, he, I, I mean, he just sent me it last night, but um, you got it too, right? We could have printed that out. But I mean, that he lists like five, four or five. I mean, there's, there's now some of the classic texts, the book of Kadam has been translated in uh, Tubdin um, I mean, you could Just go to this, I think it's the top shelf, isn't it? No, it's down here. Oh, down here. Third shelf. Every book on there, I think, just about training the mind. Um, early, the path of control's own, one which we recently discovered he took from um, Chengawa. The whole path of awakening, early, early translation by Ken McLeod turns out to be, I mean, it's, it's co authored by control, but it's pretty much word for word in all the text. And... Um, yeah, I mean, there's endless there's payment. Children has done a bunch of books. What else? There, yeah. So there's no, there's absolutely no shortage of this kind of practice, and anyone can do this practice, and you don't need any. I think I say, I ordain. You don't need any kind of anything to start looking at this and practicing it. It can't go wrong. There was a great uh, Nyingma teacher here, that, straight out of you know Amdo some a lot of years ago now 20 years ago actually we didn't see so many people straight out of Amdo then and um and uh he had been invited or sponsored i guess by the shambhala community here and um you know they like to have these they don't do individual interviews at group interviews depending on what you know what level you're at and what you've accomplished and so the you know the there's the ton there's the regular people the just plebs you know and then there's the then there's the people doing um nundro and then there's you know the tantrikas and then the sadhakas and then it's things like that and it was the highest level of one meeting and and i was translating for him and, you know, people were asking, well, should we this and that and other things? And he said, you know, I've never seen anybody change from tantric practice. And they were just kind of like jaw drops, all the whole room, like, you know. And, um, and he said, the only thing I've ever seen people change with is these mind training teachings and, you know, c trying to develop compassion is the only transformation I've seen so far, you know, kind of in Westerners. <laughs> so that was really an interesting to s thing to say in that context, I thought, you know, that it may be true, you know, we may be just aiming for the moon here, or no, we already got there, let's say, you know, that Andromeda or something, when we think we're actually gonna, you know, change our innermost being based on very esoteric instructions of any kind. So that's what I have to say about Kadampa. I mean, we could talk about mind training, but I think most of you kind of know what it's about. There's ideas of exchanging yourself for others, you know, basically the golden rule, but really feeling what others feel, um, giving up self clinging is an incredibly profound practice because of course that's a real way to undermine your belief in the existence of a self is by focusing on other. And even if from the point of view of Western psychology, you know, people, old people like me, are, have been shown to get very depressed if they're only thinking about themselves. It's a, it's a thing of despair. And unless you're involving in other people and helping the community or something, you, you sink into yourself and it's all, these are, these are great um, 
and it it's based on you know this idea that it's you know everybody has as their core this essence of compassion they always give the example of lions or something that are super super scary but they are nice to their own cubs i don't know if that's really holds up in the community of science i'm ready to go on to lamdre if you are Unless you have any questions about this. Yes? The, uh, the debate, the Samya debate, mm. and, uh, and also the attitude of Hlale uh, Yeshe'e to yeah. uh, the Nyingmas. I think the, the interesting thing is that they're both kings, and kings w want both to... Being kings. Who are the... Both, though? La Lama Yeshe'e. Oh, Chusun Okay. Then. The one who yeah. decided who won the debate, right? right. And uh, of course, kings like to rule societies that are uh, well ordered. Yes. And so the the thing that they're interested in is really ethics. Right, a way and to control the population. And so, therefore, yeah. the, what they want is a gradual training in ethics. That's right. That will sort of offset the the kind of chaotic side of the sudden, uh, il you know, right. enlightenment where people might go around saying, oh, yeah, I, I've got it. Yeah, the rogue and, element. And, you know, karma doesn't mean anything to me. I can do what I want. Right. And so there is that kind of tension. Definitely. And uh, which sort of took off in, in a big way in Tibet. Yes. And the other thing that I wanted to say is um, just to take up something you said about uh, Kadampa and how pervasive it has been in Tibetan Buddhism and, uh, and also very much in the Nyingma school. Oh, you know, you, I mean, in a way, the Kadampas were so successful that they were kind of victims of their own success. Yeah. And so, you know, there's no Kadampa school now anymore. Yeah. But it's been absorbed by all the other schools. Yeah. And like, for instance, in Longchenpa and Jigme Lingpa, you find they're constantly quoting Shantideva and the oh kind yeah. of mind, tra mind training thing. Right. And also in, in modern Nyingma, with people like Patru Rinpoche and Shabkar, they were very strong on Kadampa. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Shabka had this extraordinary combination of Nyingma, Zogchen, and his Galukpa. Yeah, site. yeah. You know, he sort of brought the two together, which was amazing considering the, the, the period when he lived. Yeah. And, and funnily enough, this kind of, I this sort of Kadampa side of the Nyingma is not complete, is not shared by everybody in, in the Nyingma person. Oh, really? So when you're talking about the meat eaters, yeah, the Nyingma person, right, and the n and the vegetarian Nyingma person, is actually reflects is this sort of oh, really? Kadampa interest. Interesting. In the Nyingma, you know, the I assume the Kadampa interest is the vegetarians. Yes, yes. I mean, Patru and Pache, Shabka, they're yeah. very, very strong. Yeah. The the uh, the teachers in Larangar nowadays right. are very very strong. Kadampa yes. Yeah. Influenced and have Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. That's but I mean, how interesting about <laughs> vegetarianism and yeah. yeah um, about the first point that you made, Wollstone. Um, I think it's is it Matthew Capstein? I think in a book called The Tibetans, which I used once as um, he puts forth this whole theory of the kings bringing in. I mean of. I mean, the, uh, here's a political, you know, like a charged term, but civilization, you know, of bringing in the, Bo the Indian Buddhist whole worldview, which was actually not even Indian Buddhist worldview, but really Indian worldview of karma, of, you know, I mean, it imposes an order, maybe that, the, I don't know if the, the not intended by the Buddha, I don't know, but... Um, and brings in a whole civilizing influence into Tibet. And he develops that theory. It's, it's, very, it's a very compelling theory. Um, King needs to have, you know, you need to have people worried about how they behave. And, um, you know, also the accumulation of merit. How else are you going to get the funds you need? You know, you have to have some theory uh, to fill the coffers of, you know, you accumulate merit by making offerings and so on, which was already present in India and in Indian Buddhism. And so, I mean, and I even found just recently reading Dubum Toku, Dubum Toku, uh, he, he had a theory that um, I like to be able to 
quote a Tibetan because it seems a little demeaning, but he sa he wonders if because he said if Tibet because Tibet had very little of its own culture or you know civilized culture, meaning educated culture, uh, is why you know India could have such a big influence, bringing in really this transference of teachings from India is like bringing in a whole new culture. I mean, an entirely new culture, you know, not not as we see it now as a sort of Asian monolithic culture and now we have to adjust to it. Um, so that's that's also like interesting, yeah. I think we've got another slide. Microphone. That supports, I think what you were saying about there being political reasons for some of these. The historical accounts of that debate in Tibetan literature were written down um, centuries later. Yeah, Re well, they were reinvented, the I would say. Yeah, <laughs> the, so the main, our main source of information about it that we all have been inheriting um, through Tibetan literature was written down centuries later as the Bashe, the Chronicles of Ba. Right, right. And this is something that Sam Van Shek goes into in his yeah. Zen Buddhism very well, makes a very compelling case uh -huh. um, for this, which I think is interesting from a practice point of view in that it we shouldn't think this was something that actually was decided but rather it may have had, as you say, yeah. like political reasons, and therefore we should actually yeah. look into the issues yeah. themselves and see like what's, exactly. you know, what you were starting to say about mental engagement or the, the um, non-attention um, versus attention, this whole debate. All yeah. these are quite interesting. And, and pertinent, yeah. Relevant to us as practitioners, yeah, yeah. we should separate out some of the yeah. um, historical accounts which may have other agendas. Yes, and but Chinese accounts are also available yes, with yes. the with the arguments that, that were put forth, and they're very profound. And so it's not, I mean, if you only look at the Tibetan version, yeah, it could be superficial. But if you really investigate it, these uh, these are yeah, you're right. They're you know really good to look into and to decide about, or just to think about even. But you have to look at both sides from both sides' of own, um, you know. Records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun Huang. But also the the, um, <sighs> the whole attitude towards of the Tibetans towards tantra is very interesting in the light of this discussion because uh, you know the Tibetans have been fascinated by tantra s since since the word go. Yeah. But there's been this kind of resistance from authority to sort of put it. You know, either you don't yeah. practice it, or you, if you do, you keep it very secret. And you know, like in China, it was it was outlawed because yeah. the emperors wanted a completely well-ordered society. Right. They didn't want any kind of crazy wisdom. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, like Atish is saying, outwardly we are pratimoksha, inwardly we're bodhisattva, secretly. They were Vajrayana, yeah. And you, you know, you get all Same these stories. Same with the vows, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah but there's that interesting tension. They in really Tibetan failed, between the two. Yeah. <laughs> don't you think? I mean. You only have to look at, you know, the Neicheng Oracle or something, or, you know, that they're all doing pujas to fend off the Chinese uh, yes, to I see know. that Tantra really gained the upper hand there, yeah, ultimately. Sure. Yeah, but, but yeah, but what I mean is, you know, like the whole story about Kern s seeing the Nyingma yogis dancing in the marketplace and yeah, saying, we should never one. do this, it should be totally secret. Therefore, he left yeah. the Nyingma school and founded the Sakya school. Yeah, you yeah, there are definitely ambivalence about it. But, but it doesn't mean to say they don't do it. It's just that they do it behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you it's can't have a bunch of p crazy people running around, you know, testing their, you know, tool shoot, you know, out there, seeing if anyone will beat them if they insult them. You'd be in a lot of trouble. But I think, you know, all governments don't want that. The Tibetan government, the Chinese government, our government, nobody wants it. So um, it had to be kept secret, which is but a perfect. The government saying, you know, that we take the inconvenience. They should be, you know, they sh they're not d dis d disapproving of certain aspects of Dzogchen Mahamudra and uh, tantric practice that they didn't like. 
Yeah. yeah. Because they want they want uh, a well-ordered society. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think that was a big, de definitely at this you know time of La, La Mieche and so forth. That was a really big, big issue. I mean, I can reread the edict if you like, but it says it very specifically. It's aimed at tantric practice and Dzogchen, just absolutely, you know, specifically named as an edict from the king, or the what's left of the king. He didn't have the whole of Tibet anymore. I had a very interesting experience in a, in a, co in a conference in uh, Vienna not long ago uh, where there were a lot of big uh, you know, Gelugpa scholars and they were talking about how language and how the texts sort of degenerate over time just in the you know, manuscript mm -hmm. traditions and so on. And so I, I was naive enough to ask him, well, what do you think about the text of the treasures? Uh. And he got very upset and he said... Um, well, he said, as a disciple of Lama Yeshe, uh, I would have to say that no Kadampa could possibly practice terma. Oh, yeah. Woo. Yeah, the terma really gets people. Terma really, you know, because it's, it's totally uncontrollable. Anyone, I didn't go into the different divisions of terma. Maybe I'll do that really quick, but I don't want to leave out Lamdre. Speaking of secret, Lamdre was the best kept secret of anybody's. But um, uh, the divisions of terma, you know, there's the element terma of like actually digging up, which the Bumpo maybe had first, <laughs> actually digging up stuff that somebody hid. I mean, be, uh, originally maybe because of persecution, but then this whole mythology developed about it. But then there's also gong ter, and then there's also... Um, Daknang, pure vision, all of that is considered under the rubric of terma. Pure vision means you just had like some vision and that's a now established. And you know, there, how can you control that? You cannot judge somebody by like, I mean, they tr even tried and they named them and the 108 Tertons and the thing and all the, you know, in defense of the whole thing, but it's way out of control. Pure vision or or, oh wait, I just remembered from the time when I was hanging out with Gurumche that something happened. And you know, you <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, stuff. And yet, the Terma literature is often so beautiful, um, maybe for that very reason, you know, that it's not controlled and standardized. But um, definitely cre gets, people, gets people shackles up and if you want to read a defense of it and, uh, from the Nyingma side, you can read in the Nyingma history, Dujim Rinpoche. The History of Nyingma School, I think, is the name of it. It's two volumes. Let's see if we can spot that one read. But anyway, I'm sure... Oh, no, that was published by Wisdom. But, um, uh, you know, that has an interesting defense of trying to defend the Terma tradition. But, yeah... The two things I think that can really, you know, test your faith maybe in Tibetan Buddhism are the Terma tradition and the Tulku tradition. I think those two are, you know, there's some, there's some major, you can drive right through them. But I don't want to get them, but maybe Lamdre is going to keep itself secret. I don't want to drag it on, but I was wondering if, if you could say something about the popular ways of controlling the Tertons, like... I was trying to explain it to someone yesterday who is interested in Trungpa Rinpoche, but they didn't know about him being a Teraton, and they're like, what is all that stuff? And yeah, I, right. And I was explaining it as like in Monty Python when they say, like, <laughs> if she's a witch, she'll float, you know, or she'll say whatever, it, you know, like they would do this kind of thing. They, they take a Teraton and be like, okay, if this is real, we're going to throw you off this cliff or something, and you can fly, you know? I mean... My, I mean but I got thrown off when you said modern ways of t testing a territory. Well, I I'm shouldn't have said mo popular. So that should. Oh, said. popular. Okay. Because yeah. I'm not familiar with any modern cases of throwing someone off a cliff. But um, they might try and poison them modernly. I don't know. Do you do you want to answer that, Wilston? Because um. I don't know what quite what to say about testing tertons. I mean, it's they're supposed to be guidelines. Yes, there are. There's a. There's an interesting text by the third Dodrup Chen Rinpoche called On the Terma Tradition, in which he talks, it's been translated by Tukul Tondup, in fact, Hidden Teachings of Tibet. Oh, okay. It's not Shambhala, it's a, another it's by Wisdom. For, yeah. yeah, the other, the other big publishing house. <laughs> and so Buddhism. he, yes, he talks about uh, the, the uh, existence of false tertons and false termas, and there are sort of criteria for judging them. 
I can't remember what they are, but you'll find them described in this book. And um, did the, was there cliff throwings? Uh, no, it's to do with the the, the way they kind of uh, yeah. uh, you know what they say is, and also they put the because one of the things about the when a tert when a Tertan reveals a treasure, he usually keeps it secret for many years and practices it secretly, and puts it to the test, and uh, one of the one of the criterion is actually to see whether the practitioner of this treasure uh, improves or uh, pr progresses along the path or not, or whether. Mm -hmm. But usually, it's it is uh, I think judged by already well established tertans. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. I mean, there's the part about they're supposed to have been predicted. All Guru Rinpoche, Padmasambhava, you know, was supposed to predict by name individually mm -hmm. each future tertan. And uh, so, ex but this says, I don't think this counts for Daknang. That's the that's the one subcategory that's for ex especially hard to control. But um, and so they have to go back and find their prophecy to, s to really claim their uh, status as a Tertan. And mm. But prophecies, of course, <laughs> are often in Terma. So then it gets a little bit self-serving, possibly. Mm -hmm. But, um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a slight difference in Tanang and the other kinds of Gong Terma. Ter, yeah. Because the Tanang... All the all the termas are connected with Guru Rinpoche, and the Tertans are his previous disciples. But a Tanang may n may may not may be. Not be. Yeah. And it's a direct vision of with a, a Yidam deity. Yeah. So like the fifth Dalai Lama received a uh, number of Tanang yeah. teachings, and the the empowerment that His Holiness gave recently in Strasbourg was actually one of the Tanang of the the fifth mm -hmm. Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Ta well, he tak, tak, I, I tak called it Dakna. Means pure yeah. vision. Yeah. Pure appearance. Gongter, Gongter means uh, intention or uh, almost you could say m mental, you know, terma, which means well the story of that is that a person remember Padmasambhava, you know, implanted in their mind stream at the time that he was in Tibet various teachings. And in their later incarnations, you know, down the line, they suddenly remember it, those teachings from, so it's a very short lineage. Again, it's the way of ancient, you know, ancient wisdom for modern times. And um, and then, then it's offered as the real true words of Guru Rinpoche. So that's Gong Ter. Um, those are more the predicted and prophesied tertans. Uh, the, the, the Tak Nang is, uh, more and you know anyone can have a I really want I mean these guys had a lot of visions I don't know what happened I don't meet so many people <laughs> that aren't in institutions that have these kind of <laughs> visions but, but the, uh, do you want to go on you, maybe you want to I do want to go because uh, we're just kind of running out of time here and I don't want to short shrift the sock the uh, lamdre so Lamdre uh, is next. Um, Lamdre means the path with its the path with its fruition, um, which is a very general, you could say, tantric or Vajrayana principle, which is that the result of practice, the result of your whole spiritual path, it can actually be practiced right now. You don't. So it's a, in some ways a a new take, it's neither the instantaneous path or the gradual path. It's, and this is part of basic principles of Vajrayana, that you are practicing the result. When you visualize yourself as a deity, for instance, you're practicing the result. You're not a deity. And yet you are because you have Buddha nature. And so the realization of that Buddha nature is you use the stepping stone of a of a visualization of a deity in order to realize it. So you're, you're already practicing the result. So that's where that terminology comes from. Um, it comes from the, speaking of dachna, you know, pure vision, all, basically all of the, everything is from <laughs> pure vision, but the goddess, tantric goddess, Nairatma, who is usually coupled with Hevadra, um, gave these teachings to the in great Indian Mahasiddha Virupa, 
this is 7th to 8th century, a lot of, almost all kind of manga eventually you, goes back to the Mahasiddhas of India. Um, when Barupa formulated her, her instructions, they became known as the oral tr instructions together with the esoteric instructions of the path with the result, and, but they're usually just called the Vajra lines. Uh, Virupa's teachings, the Vajra lines. And really, all of Lamdre connects back to Virupa and these Vajra lines. Um, it's a path. The path and the result is a system of tantric. I'm taking this from Cyrus Stern's Treasury of Esoteric Instruction, where the secrets are finally out. Um, uh, Theory and practice based generally on all the highest tantras, specifically on the three scriptures known as the Tantra Trilogy of Hevajra and especially on the Hevajra Tantra itself. Um, the Vajra Lines represents an oral revelation of the distilled essence of these tantras. So much of the line and so these teachings, starting with Virupa, um, kept going. I should just finish this. Um, all the with the result encoded within it are transmitted orally, were transmitted orally without any written text for at least eight generations. I'm beginning, now that I'm translating stuff in Shija, I'm beginning to realize how totally important to Indian Buddhism it was never to write something down. The oral tradition, I mean, it was really considered the total degeneration to finally write it down. And I think these things are carryovers from that Vedic tradition. But anyway, that's just my new theory. Um, so he first, Virupa first gave the Vajra line specifically to his disciple Kanha as a summation of the entire path to enlightenment in the tradition of Buddhist Tantra. Kanha spoke the lines to Dhammarupa, who taught Avaduti, who gave them to Gayadhara. We're now talking, uh, you know, still in the 10th century. Gayadhara came to Tibet in 1041 and taught the great Tibetan translator Drokmi Lotsawa Shakya Eshe. So Drokmi, you see in that scheme is the one, the, the, the charioteer. Um, Drokmi memorized the lines in the original Indian dialect and then spoke them in Tibetan to his disciples. Uh, this is a great feat of instant, instantaneous, what they call instantaneous translation. He memorized them in the Indian dialect and then spoke them to his disciples. Um, <clears throat> so, so then, they received the path and the result in t Tibetan. Then the Vajra lines in, uh, continued in Tibetan to be memorized and passed down in an oral transmission until the time of Sachen Kunga Nyingpo. So that's, he's in the 12th century. Um, Sachen Kunga Nyingpo, the first of the great Sakya forefathers, as they're called, the Sakya Gongmanga. And so uh, this is when it starts to be Sakya you know, specifically connected with this particular school, so-called. Um, the Lamdre, you know, is held by the Sakya in itself, not Sakya. It's, you know, an Indian teaching. Um, and he finally wrote it down in 1141, a hundred years after it arrived in Tibet. So there's the pre-Tibet history and the hundred years in Tibet, it's never written down. This is an amazing oral lineage. Um, so Drokmi himself, according to um, Jamgun Control, is a primary source of secret mantra, and he even claims since, since the two great translators, Marpa Lotsawa and Gur Lotsawa, were his students as translators, he's like the, the king of translators, Drokmi. Uh, his disciple, Drokmi's disciple, Kun Kuncho Gyalpo, built the Sakya Gompa in Tsang, which is called Sakya, <laughs> great or gray earth or white, whitish gray earth because of the color of the land. And that's when, you know, the school called Sakya sort of gets its name and has its identity. Um, the five great masters of Sakya, or the, they're all related. And it, it, you really can't talk about Sakya without talking about a whole uh, cultural thing about Tibet and clans. I mean, Tibet started with clans, even in the even in the revised history of, you know, the monkey and Avalokiteshvara mating and having the clan. You know, way way back, there's clans, and it's a it's a lot like I think the the, the one culture that reminds some Tibetans the most of their own is the the Scottish. You know, where everybody's got their own skirt that's a different color, but. 
Um, the, the clans are huge, and especially the Sakya clan comes from a clan called the Kun clan, very, very ancient clan of Tibet, and they take a great deal of pride in that. And another thing that distinguishes Sakya is um, bec because of that clan affiliation is that the lineage is almost always familial, so they don't generally become monks, at least not the, lead not the leaders or throne holders. Uh, they need to have family to continue the Kun lineage, and it's, uh, it's all about family. And of course, there's been family feuds, and that creates huge things, and uh, we could talk about that if we had time, but we don't. And um, so those five, then, I should mention them all because they're all, you know, fantastic. Um, there's that first one, Sachin Kung and Ningpo, um, then his two sons, Sun Amtsemo and Jetsun Drakpa, Jaltsen, and then his nephew, Sakya Pandita, is the fourth. Sakya Pandita had an unbelievable influence, an uh, unbelievable person, statesman, you know, politician, scholar. Uh, he's the one that really went, you know, really criticized some of the things developing in Tibet in, in a good way. I mean, in a really nasty way, in a way, but still, you know, you need to. And then his nephew, Sakya Pandita's nephew, Pakpa, also had a huge influence. Uh, he's the one that, you know, got the Mongols coming in and everything. But um, Kongtrul identifies nine cycles of, uh, of Lamdre altogether, and this is just the first one. And there's some teachings in it, and it's been held deeply secret. I mean, this, this was really the secret of secrets, more secret than anything else, I think, even than like Dzogchen and Trekcher and Togal and stuff. But um, recently, you can find it in Cyrus Stern's new book. It's a black book, so you can't find it. But anyway, oh yeah, that was wisdom too, right? But um, is it Shambhala? Oh, great. Um, they, there's some teachings that have been available for a long time from this cycle, which is called Lamdre. Um, they start with the teachings which are called Nangsum, the three appearances or the three visionary appearances. Uh, m my second greatest ever teacher, Dejan Rinpoche, uh, wrote a book called Three Levels of Spiritual Perception about this. And basically the three kinds of perception is very similar to like what we find in um, the uh, Uttara Tantra a little bit, which is the impure vision, yogic vision, and pure vision. And um, particularly the yogic vision is very interesting to read about. And basically what that is is you know, when, when you're beginning to understand that everything is kind of, you know, what you've been misperceiving all this time, yogic vision, you start to have experiences of compassion and love and all those kind of things, as well as higher kinds of realization, or different kinds of, you know, I suppose you could call f philosophical realizations of the nature of phenomena. And then there's something called the three continua, which, uh, and there's many more, uh, but the, these three kind of cover the, all the basics of the causal continuum, which is basically that there's no difference in samsara and nirvana. Samsara is nirvana and vice versa, which can be um, both confusing and liberating at the same time. A very kind of ironic statement, maybe zenish. I, re I saw <laughs> One of my very old students from Naropa bumped into him and we got in a conversation with other Naropa students and he was saying like, well, back when I went to Naropa, samsara was different than nirvana, <laughs> which I really kind of appreciated the freshness of that because we all think we understand, oh, samsara and nirvana are the same, but maybe it's more useful to think of them as different for a while. Um, and then the next is the path, which is um, the four empowerments and basically practicing Vajrayana. And uh, in the teachings that Kongtrul, when he, uh, um, I wanted to include this because when he explains it, he, it's all of this is this kind of a pep talk of about you, yes, you can. You can practice Vajrayana. You can do it. You can do it. Why? Because you have Buddha nature. You know, you have the nature of enlightenment already. And so just go ahead and practice this stuff, you know, in case you're like all worried about it. So I kind of like that one. And then the result continuum, which is the integration of the five kayas and the five kinds of awareness. So those are um, just the very t 
step one and two of a, a huge, you know, kind of, I, I mean, you can look it up in Treasury of Knowledge and Esoteric Instructions. If you don't want to read the whole of Cyrus's like giant books on it, there's two also. He did the cla Tibetan classics. He is the absolute, really, authority of Western scholars on don't read anyone else. I'm going to kind of just say that, um, such as, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> anyway, um, I want a, a very accessible teaching, and speaking of pure vision, um, that Sachin Kunga Ningpo had was Manjushri, and this is, this is the kind of teaching you can always ask for in, if you want a connection with the Sakya teachings. Um, uh, he had a vision of Manjushri, Sachin Kunga Ningpo, that w first one who wrote, who wrote down the Vajra lines of Virupa, and Manjushri said to him if this, if you are attached to this life, you are not a religious person. If you are attached to the cycle of existence, you, do not, you are not a renunciate. If you are attached to your own goals, you have no bodhicitta, no mind of awakening, and if there's grasping, you do not have the view. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. So those four lines became the basis for a whole series of teachings which later came to be called parting from the four attachments, you know, how to not have those four became like the accessible for the people Sakya teachings that are very profound. And I even translated it um, for, I translated it for um, Jetson Kusho, one of the rare Tibetan women who teach, um, you know, in the lineage and are, are accepted by the lineage, who's, she's the sister of Sakya Trinzen. So that's really all I have to say about the Lamdre teachings and the Sakya teachings because they're such an incredible, deep, profound, and you know, amazing thing. So that's it. So there are any questions about that? Or yeah. Sorry, did the, uh, the, the, the text of the Vision of Shri? Yeah. Is it oh yeah. No, no, it is. Yeah. In fact, I don't. I I would don't know if I could even find the um, Tibetan anymore. I can't remember if I have it. Um, it's called the Three Levels of Spiritual Perception. It's a big, thick book, and it's very detailed. It's it's really good, actually. He was amazing. I mean, Dejan Rinpoche. I think I said this yesterday, but he was. Uh, I was just so lucky that. You know, and I, I was actually living in the same household as Cyrus Stearns at the time we were both studying with Dejan Rinpoche in Seattle. Uh, and he, Kala Rinpoche's students were all told, like, oh, what do we do when you're not here, Rinpoche? And, and Rinpoche said, study with Dejan Rinpoche. So there was always this, like, well-traveled route between Vancouver and Seattle to see Dejan Rinpoche. And he was really incredible. And Kala Rinpoche, someone asked me last night this, and when Kala Rinpoche assigned me to do this Machik's complete explanation, I kept asking, you know, what can I study with this Lama, that Lama, you know, who, who am I going to get help from? And he said, there's only one learned Lama in America, and that's Dejan Rinpoche. And, they and then Dejan Rinpoche took Kala Rinpoche as his second root guru and always addre addressed him and called him Vajradhara. He said, Dorje Chong, Lama Dorje Chong said this and that, you know, even though they were the same age, both like in their 80s. And it was really a beautiful thing. Dejan Rimshe was like uh, such a beautiful thing to watch because he was really, truly Rime, really deeply, truly Rime. Like if you sat down to eat with him, he had to do prayers to every lineage and your food would be cold and you'd be looking at it, you know, like, <laughs> do we get to... <laughs> I mean, I spent my early 20s with him, which is really strange for a you know, hippie from Malibu to be hanging out with an 80-year-old crippled, because he was crippled. He couldn't, you know, he had a pin in his leg, had to stick it out straight, could never sit in meditation. But, I mean, he's still just the kindest man. And yet, so devoted in the Sakya lineage, he could take a Kargi guru, he could teach, he always taught people their own lineage, but he himself had so much faith in all the lineages. He really was like the paradigm of what Rime is truly supposed to be. 
because it's not supposed to be a mishmash. It's supposed to be, you know, you really go deeply in one, which is exactly what he did, but he knew them all. God, I wish that he had been around longer, but anyway. I don't know, I want to say that about him, and there's a wonderful book by David Jackson about him called A Saint in Seattle, uh, if you want to read about him. Oh, and incidentally, I want to recommend one more book before that, that I'm just, did I already do this? Anyway, I, I think I did say it, Kong Tol's biography of um, Jamyang Kensei Wangpo, which is published by Seichen Gompa, Seichen Monastery. It's a very wonderful, it's sometimes if you don't like to read all this, you know, scholarly stuff, you can read biographies and really get just as much, or like the life of Shapgar, or you know, some of these biographies make it a little more, I wa I'm not gonna say more real, because actually <laughs> it's still just as fantastical, but just more fun. Yeah. Oh, it's called The Life of Damian Kensei Wangpo. I yeah. I like him. He starts right off the bat saying, I'm not making any concessions in this translation. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I just got it, so I haven't read the whole thing. I just read it. Uh, what's the name of the article by Sarah Oh, uh, well, I'll have to get that to you. I did have it down somewhere, but I was I trying to have less papers so that I'd get less confused. I think I got less confused this time, and thank you for having the lights not so bright because that helped a lot. Um, I have it in here somewhere. On the, this one by Sam Van Shaik is specifically about Dzogchen. Um, hmm. I can it, find it and bring it later. Yeah, it was good. Wait, it's got to be in here somewhere though. Yeah, look at all the pieces of, here it is. It's called The Early Days of the Great Perfection. It was published in Jayabs. You know, it's, 2004, actually. Um, actually, I have a whole like thing I did on that, but now we're out of time. Well, I have two minutes. Um, let me read his final statement on it. He says, if the Dunhuang texts tell us anything, it is that we cannot posit a great perfection tradition existing in the ninth and 10th centuries. <laughs> The texts, which in varying degrees acknowledged or moved away from their basis in the Maya Jala Tantras, were not the homogenous group presented in the Samten Mikdrun. Thus, the development of the great perfection as a distinct tradition begins to look like the work of certain <laughs> determined individuals. So it's a little controversial uh, in terms of a lot of theories of Dzogchen right now, like Namke Norbu and even its own history and yeah. Interesting. But this is, I'm just realizing, 2004. He might have a whole new version, which would be on his website, probably. It's a great website for ancient Tibet, I think. Yeah, his blog. Yeah, a lot of great um, stuff. Uh, but I use his book in class, which I still think is the best one I found on the history of Tibet for, like, especially for undergrads, but also grad students. But um, it's still the best one, but it's clear that his real forte is ancient Tibet, and then it gets to modern, and it's like, yeah, it's okay, but not as, you know, not as great, actually. So. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for bearing with. And you'll get a great relief this evening with Elizabeth. Whew. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to briefly talk about Shangpa. So I want to do that first only because it's shorter and um, so you don't get think that it's Kargyu. <laughs> I have an issue about that. And, uh, and then Elizabeth will talk about Kargyu, which I'm, I'm so delighted that she's going to do that. So thank you.